The show has a scope and a kind of a cinematic quality. It's just really creative. Production designing is great because it, it changes e each year. It's like you think that it can't get any better and then it does. It's a great show for a designer because you've got lots of different worlds to create. It is science fiction, but it's also very reality based and you've got lots of characters who just are in a very real world. It just has a very interesting mix of this fresh California feel and old B-movie scary things um, that I think gives it a really neat texture and a really neat look, something that's a little bit off from your everyday horror anthology show. These flowers are wrong. They're all wrong. I can't abide them. Let's try something different with the flowers then. I mean, we had Steve Hardy doing the sets for the first season, and he did a wonderful job. And Carrie had been working with him, and so when Steve moved on, we just bumped Carrie up, and then Carrie it just blew us all away with every design. You just sit down and you take a script and you read it, and an idea comes into your head of what that space is going to be like for a particular scene. When I came in second season, I uh, sat down and figured out a, a big factory for Spike and Drusilla to inhabit. Me and Drew, we're moving in. Joss had come to me and said he was thinking about placing them in some sort of factory kind of industrial space. Vampires living underground, living in, you know, sort of decrepit areas, um, places that felt abandoned. And so I generated a sketch of a factory that really sort of got me the job. The library was very important. It was sort of the hub where, where so much of the, the research and just the life of these kids in school w w would take place. It was quite a beautiful space. It had a lot of wood and had a huge skylight atop it, and it had beautiful windowed offices for, for Giles. It almost felt a little English. Giles would be in there drinking his tea at times. And of course, no student except our kids ever entered the library. So this was always a running gag. Like, and if, in fact, on the rare occasion someone came in there to get a book, they would look at him askance. Excuse me, but have you ever heard of knocking? We're supposed to get some books on Stalin. Oh, yes, yes, uh, third row, historical biographies. We work in a, you know, not a real stage. It's a, it's a big old series of warehouses that are all one big building that we've divided up into three different stages. They've got very low ceilings. They're pitched everywhere with steel columns. And so for that factory set, I essentially took the structure of the stage and used it and let the ceiling of the stage be the ceiling of that factory. And I used a lot of the structure of the, of the stage as the set and just sort of walled it off. The way that the show is shot and that with the vampires in our world that there's a certain texture and depth and darkness. Everything had that feel to it. Our sort of bedroom set has this cave-like feeling. And then we ended up moving into this mansion that had a much more sort of modern, sterile look to it. We built a mansion for Angel, which was a nice set and had a sort of an outdoor garden, but it was kept in the shade. We wanted to sort of stay away from Gothic architecture and Gothic themes. Joss just didn't want to keep going there as such a sort of stereotypical vampire mode. One of the major concepts of the show is that these vampires sort of have to live in a dark world, um, you know, not just theoretically, but actually physically. A lot of times we'll have them in an above ground space like the mansion, but uh, typically they're sort of in the sewers underneath Sunnydale or like in first season, the master vampire, first nemesis of the series. I lived in an underground church. It was an idea of Joss's that there had been a terrible demonic force. Uh, the master tried to escape from hell and had been sucked, you know, down into hell and was actually trapped in this church, which was a constant source of pain, of course, to him being a, being a vampire. And uh, that was a neat set that you could get to through the tunnels and you, you could walk down through the rubble. Not only was the church underground, but we had sewers connected to it that sort of fell into this bowel of the church underground. So that developed that whole theme and concept of uh, the vampires sort of living underground and being able to get around Sunnydale through the sewers. The set, the wardrobe, the makeup, and everything that goes into portraying a character or being in a mood makes an impact on you. It makes it that much more believable. We come before you with fresh offerings. Offerings? Well, the way that the series was set up is that we had the underground world. It was really dark and heavy and concrete. Um, and then you sort of had the above ground world, which was much lighter mood. You know, the colors were softer and a little more pastel. And... Joss had had this idea about Sunnydale, a very sunny all-American town. We scouted a lot of 
you know, various locations here in town that we felt would match that. Uh, people will note that the high school is, the, in fact, the same high school. They shot Beverly Hills 90210 at, and it's a very kind of classic upper middle to middle class Southern California look. And the way that translated into the sets and the design of the show was we wanted Buffy in a craftsman house. It's been really great to watch the house grow. You know, in season one when we were just starting, initially we used the house in Torrance, so we shot in the actual house that it is. And then slowly, bit by bit, as the show became successful, and they reconstructed the house. Of course, the second floor was always here at the studio, but initially that was just Buffy's bedroom. And then gradually the downstairs part of the house uh, came together here at the stage and even the front porch for entrances and exits. But it's really interesting because you have a sense of the house from Torrance in the first season and sometimes we still do exteriors there and then the house here. So it's really interesting that it's a, you know, a, a home that sort of exists in, in two places. It, it's old and it has a lot of character. Gosh, it's hard to imagine it being anything else, particularly with, you know, demons, some of whom are thousands of years old, visiting it. It should at least be a craftsman, right? I can't, <laughs> can't imagine it as some modern box, but it has a lot of character and I think a really good feeling. It's really homey. And essentially, we took the exterior that we'd picked in first season and designed an interior that just completely matched it. Here we are at uh, Buffy's exterior of her house. And if you come around the corner, 1630, Buffy's house. You're in the front foyer. Uh, of course, most of this set wilds away just like any other set. Uh, the staircase is actually on, actually on wheels. So we could, if we'd need to, take the whole staircase out and film a scene back into the living room or out the front door looking at the translight or, you know, back into the uh, dining room around the corner. Uh, but if you come this way, you're into the uh, living room. Mom? Uh, this set's gone through several modifications, new floors, a uh, couple new doors here and there. These doors right behind you have uh, gone through many breakaway versions. And if you keep coming around the corner here, this set sort of works like a large donut. If you keep coming around the corner, you can come right through the back hall. You're right into the kitchen. Uh, so you're in the kitchen here. Of course, this is on wheels. As is all these exterior walls. They're all on wheels. This whole outside of the set can just go away quite quickly. We can shoot back into the set whenever we need to. So coming out of the kitchen, we're into the dining room here. And sort of a very stereotypical craftsman bungalow uh, dining room. Got a high wainscoting. This is where you place a picture just like this or a plate sometimes. Um, some nice furniture here. This is kind of interesting. This, this backsplash used to be mirror. Of course, that's difficult for the camera. So we've covered it up with uh, what looks like some nice uh, prairie style tile, but it's really just foam core with a uh, you know color print on it and then scored to look like tile. And then uh, back out of the dining room and into the foyer and then we're out of the set. Here we are in Buffy's uh, upstairs hallway. Over here's the uh, stairs down. There's the bathroom and dress set. This is Buffy's bedroom. First of all, this is my room. Second. Been going through my things? Yes, I have. Personally, I love being in Buffy's uh, bedroom, rummaging through all of her drawers and things. Uh, it gave me a kind of little extra stepfather kind of thrill. Uh, had nothing to do with the script, but it's how I prepare. All right. This is the uh, one of the only remaining sets from uh, season one. I'm sure you know it well. Uh, here's the the windows that she, obviously Buffy goes in and out of quite frequently or somebody else comes in and out of quite frankly as well. We change posters every once in a while, but uh, we try to keep it intact almost from first season so that we really have a continuity. It's the only thing that's sort of continuous in Buffy's house is her bed, or in Buffy's life is her bedroom, really. Well, here we are in uh, Giles's apartment. All the walls pull away uh, at this beam here. All the walls above it are just sort of hung with cable so we can pull the lower eight feet out pretty much all the way around. In this set, the staircase does not pull out. It's always stationary. But from the staircase all the way around 
to this corner and into this archway is pullable. You can wild it out and get a camera back there and shoot into the set. This is Giles' little kitchen around the corner here. You go into the hallway through this little arch and Giles brews quite a bit of tea back here in this kitchen. So we bronze in it tonight? Wednesday is kind of beat. The bronze was meant to sort of feel like a nightclub, but really was an espresso bar. It was an industrial space that had been converted into a, you know, this, this nightclub coffee bar. And visually, it was painted with quite a few bright colors as if the, an artist had come in and just sort of, not just painted the walls, but it actually as if they were painting a canvas. It has an entrance that leads out actually off the side of one of our stages. And then when we developed the back lot in second season, across the alley, we built a whole series of facades of brick and little buildings that created this dark alleyway where lots of scenes sort of took place, not just outside the bronze, but just a little dark alleyway that we would dress differently to make it some other little alley off in Sunnydale somewhere. Don't just stand there. Dig. We have to hurry. Joss had always discussed the idea of tr somehow trying to do a graveyard here on the lot. And then I was just walking around in the parking lot one day and kind of realized that if we had sort of focused our direction the other way, looking off our lot, there was, you know, the whole vista of trees. So I came up with this idea to put a, a big stone wall in front of that, sort of blocking out the buildings that were underneath all those trees in the vista and just making it feel like a, a wall of the cemetery. And it gave you this huge depth of space and made you feel like you were in a big greened area. We built some large mausoleums and things on the backside. Um, and then within that space, in the greened areas, we actually dug out some pits that were grave sites. So it was, an, it was a nice idea to, to be able to have lots of elements of you know, vampires coming out of graves or actually lowering a coffin down into the ground and be able to do all that right here. Carrie is just really creative and does a tremendous amount with what we have. Even though we try to keep some sort of reality base to it, you know, we're dealing with vampires.